Hi everyone. Uh, we're turning our attention today to um, the build-up to the South African War. Um, so looking at events in South Africa, uh, specifically the conflict, the, the growing tension between the British and the Afrikaners in the 1880s and 1890s. Um, and uh, this will give us a look at some uh, key individuals who really animated uh, the history of South Africa in this period, um, but also at uh, some global processes that uh, impinged on South Africa and, and really kind of defined um, its place in the world and, and uh, uh, influenced the course of events that, that happened in the country itself. Um, the British in the second half of the 19th century were growing their empire tremendously, right? Uh, so they had established control over the sea lanes. Uh, in the in the fight with Napoleon, um, you know, at the end of the 18th, early in, in the beginning of the 19th century, uh, they had consolidated their control over key places in the British Empire, like India. Um, you know, as the over the course of the early 19th century, and their their goal, and this was driven largely by um, the conservative government uh, under Benjamin Disraeli, um, and later under Lord Salisbury. Uh, but also by personalities within the British Empire, uh, colonial officials and uh, British merchants um, who were committed to this cause. Uh, anyway, the, animated by individuals who um, saw the best hope for the world in the British Empire, right? Um, and foremost among these, at least for our purposes, was Cecil Rhodes, uh, who is pictured here in a political cartoon. Um, this is Rhodes. Um, with one foot in the Cape and the other one in Egypt. Uh, his vision for British control of Africa was Cairo to the Cape, right? In other words, spanning the entirety of the continent. Um, this image, by the way, is called the Colossus of Rhodes, an imitation of the ancient statue uh, leading into uh, or spanning the harbor of the city of Rhodes, if you know anything about that, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Um, well, Rhodes now has become the new Colossus, right? Uh, and Rhodes himself is an interesting personality. Um, he was, he, he kind of alternated his time between England and, and South Africa. Um, he was a student at the University of Oxford, though he didn't graduate till he was in his late 20s because he, he spent a lot of his time prospecting for diamonds and later for gold um, uh, in, in South Africa. Uh, by, the, by 1881, right around the time he graduated from, from Oxford, um, he became a member of Cape Parliament um, and uh, became the, uh, the Cape Governor um, in 1890. Rhodes would go on later, I, I should mention this now in case I forget to do it later, um, would go on to found with his massive fortune uh, the Rhodes Scholarship, which is one of the most prestigious scholarships in the world, though if you know anything about uh, Cecil Rhodes, um, you wonder if it, you know, it's really worth being associated with that name. Okay, he's a pretty polarizing figure. Uh, in any case, the strategy, and Rhodes really is kind of representative of this, that Britain had for South Africa was to vest a lot of power in the Cape government and uh, let it expand under the leadership of people like Rhodes. Um, though when this idea was put into place, Rhodes was, no long, was not yet a factor um, in the politics. Uh, however, the Cape government proved to be not as strong, perhaps, as, as the most ardent British imperialists had anticipated. Uh, this was, um, the strategy only had a, a very limited effect. Um, one of its uh, initial successes when in, was in the annexation of the Transvaal in 1877, and there was a sequence of events leading up to this. Um, the Transvaal at the time had a very kind of weak president, Thomas Francois Burgers, um, and uh, a lot of the even Afrikaner residents of the Transvaal were um, not very happy with his leadership, and so uh, the British were able to exploit that. Um, uh, Theophilus Shepstone, who we've talked about, uh, who was a, actually an unelected official in Natal, uh, he went to Pretoria and sort of set up residence there, began to talk to people, uh, began to talk up the, the benefits of being under British rule, um, and uh, he then sent reports to London uh, suggesting that, that uh, the Afrikaners would not resist if, if uh, the British simply annexed the Transvaal. And so they did in 1877. 
Um, but the resistance was much greater than Shep Stone had anticipated. Um, uh, within a couple of years, uh, there were disputes over taxation. Um, and finally, an armed uprising. The Afrikaners waged a, a guerrilla campaign against British positions. Um, and uh, this became simply too much for uh, the British to tolerate. They, they you know, were not equipped or didn't anticipate and, and were not really equipped or interested in uh, trying to fight an, an all-out war at this point against the Afrikaners. Um, and so they capitulated in 1881 and handed over um, what amounted to self-government again to, uh, to the Transvaal. In the midst of all of this, um, the Afrikaners were coming into their own as a people. Uh, they were uh, beginning to produce their own kind of political theory and their own sense of nationalism. Uh, there were a couple of key figures in this. Uh, one was a, a Dutch Reformed Domini, um, uh, that is minister uh, of the Dutch Reformed Church, whose name was S.J. Dutoy. Um, he wrote a number of pamphlets, um, newspaper articles, kind of uh, fire-breathing nationalist uh, type rhetoric um, that uh, called for all Afrikaners to unite. And we need to realize at this point that even though the Transvaal and the Orange Free State were these independent Afrikaner republics, that the majority of Afrikaners still lived in the Cape under British rule. Uh, and Dutoy himself was a resident of the Cape, yet he was calling upon Afrikaners in the Cape to unite in a nationalist sentiment with their brothers and sisters in the Transvaal and in the Orange Free State, right? And so this uh, presented a real challenge to the British who were still intent uh, on achieving full control uh, over a unified South Africa. Um, a more middle ground was taken by another Cape Afrikaner, actually he was a member of the Cape Parliament for a long time, uh, whose name was Jan Hofmeyer. Uh, he became the founding leader of this organization in the Cape called the Afrikaner Bond. Um, that, that is uh, Afrikaner Unity uh, Organization, okay. Um, and this became the chief vehicle in the Cape, uh, united with uh, the, the governments of the Transvaal and the Orange Free State to foment for uh, Afrikaner nationalism. But Hofmeyer himself was really quite pragmatic. Um, in fact, uh, as of the 1880s, Hofmeyer and Cecil Rhodes formed a kind of partnership. Hofmeyer recognized, uh, for instance, that South Africa needed the British Navy to protect its interests. Um, that uh, coming closer to the British was not necessarily a bad thing. Um, and Hofmeyer supported Rhodes in his quest to um, achieve greater political position in the Cape. Um, and so this was a, a rather unlikely but fairly fruitful partnership for both of these individuals, uh, at least until the early uh, 1890s when things fall, fell apart for them. Uh, however, this um, moderate position uh, uh, occupied by Hofmeyer in the Cape was offset to a great extent by the uh, more hardline positions taken uh, by the uh, newly emerged president. Uh, this is after independence, after the reestablishment of independence in the Transvaal in 1881. Uh, the, the guy who became president there was Paul Kruger. Um, and Paul Kruger, like Cecil Rhodes, is one of the truly towering figures over this whole period. Um, Kruger himself, this is, I switched the slide because this is a picture of Paul Kruger here. Uh, and I think that just his face is very telling of the kind of person he was. Um, Paul Kruger was, a, shall we say, a, a unique individual. Um, uh, he um, was at his heart a pioneering farmer. Right, uh, he was a Boer, if there ever was one. Okay, um, and by that I mean B-O-E-R, right? The Afrikaner word for farmer. Um, uh, his his uh, outlook was very much focused on the land of South Africa, uh, on it as an agricultural uh, community, um, on the heritage, uh, the Dutch heritage, um, and trek Boer heritage of the Afrikaner people. Uh, he was also a very devout Christian um, who believed that 
the only book anyone should read was the Bible, and that the Bible ought to be taken literally. Uh, Kruger went to his deathbed believing, based on his reading of the book of Genesis, that the world was flat. Um, he tra- and he traveled the world. He, he went to London uh, as head of a, a delegation representing the Transvaal at one point. He, you know, he sailed all over the world, um, but uh, uh, even in his old age, he called people liars when they told him the world was round, uh, because the Bible was to be taken literally, right? Um, uh, however, despite that rather limited, I, I suppose, limited outlook, um, on the world itself, uh, Kruger was still a skillful politician, um, a motivator of his own people to resist British influence, um, somebody who uh, really brought the Afrikaners together as a people um, under the uh, uh, under the flag of the Transvaal. And so, the uh, despite this um, alliance that Rhodes had with Hofmeyer. Um, uh, his chief kind of relationship was one of rivalry with Kruger. Now, Rhodes was backed in his position. Um, and again, Rhodes, you know, felt very strongly that the British ought to dominate the world, um, that the English-speaking people should be in a position of primacy all over the world, and that they would serve as the catalyst for making the world much better than it was. Um, uh, so that was, you know, all part of his, his kind of thinking about the, the expansion of the British Empire. Uh, he was backed by the government of Lord Salisbury, which came to power. This is the conservative, uh, uh, the conservative party in Britain, which um, uh, uh, won an election in the early 1890s. Uh, you know, ousting the the Liberal Party of William Gladstone, which had a much more uh, kind of mixed uh, sense of the um, justice of imperial expansion. Uh, Salisbury and his um, newly appointed Foreign Secretary Joseph Chamberlain. Uh, were ardent imperialists, and the conservative parliament uh, was convinced that you know the way forward was to fully incorporate and unify, fully incorporate all of these African republics, and to create a unified South Africa. Now, they Rhodes became an extension of Chamberlain in South Africa. Rhodes was uh, named the governor of the Cape in 1890, so so he was in charge there. Uh, he and Chamberlain were in close communication with each other, um, and their strategy was to try to unite their imperialist pretensions with uh, the desires of the British people living in the Transvaal. Now, you know, by this point, gold had been discovered in uh, Johannesburg, um, and thousands of British. Uh, prospectors had, had flooded into the Transvaal and settled in that area. Um, Rhodes uh, um, communicated with some of the leaders, some of the more prominent individuals uh, in that community. Um, this group, by the way, was referred to by the by the Afrikaners as the Eightlanders, uh, U-I-T-L-A-N-D-E-R-S, uh, the Eightlanders, uh, Outlanders is really kind of the translation, or foreigners. Um, but Rhodes, I mean, by this point, by the early 1890s, the, this community of Eightlanders uh, was nearly as large or maybe had even eclipsed the Afrikaners in population. How, but they were not accorded equal rights. They didn't have uh, the right to vote, for instance. Uh, they were not recognized as um, permanent citizens of the Transvaal. Uh, and so Rhodes uh, figured that he could... Um, reach out to some of these eight lenders, form a committee uh, of sorts in the Transvaal made up of British people um, that would foment for reform and specifically for the extension of the right to vote to the eight lenders. Um, uh, and so, you know, th- that that thing was formed kind of on the sly. Now, with the backing of Chamberlain, um, Rhodes also formulated a plan together with a fellow named Leander Starr Jameson. Uh, Jameson was uh, a British official, um, uh, of rather minor importance actually, uh, at this point functioning in the Bechuana Land Protectorate, but uh, they came up with a plan that um, Jameson would lead a group of British soldiers, about 500 of them, on a raid into the Transvaal 
and that simultaneously the reform committee in Johannesburg would rise up, seize control of that city, um, and j link up with Jameson, and they would attack Pretoria um, and uh, force Kruger to capitulate and to accept British rule. Uh, so that was the plan. Uh, this was put into effect in 1896. Um, now, in the lead up to this, uh, they received messages from the leaders of the Reform Committee that the uh, British people of Johannesburg uh, were not really receptive to this plan, that they were not planning to organize on any kind of scale, um, that this was likely to fail because of the lack of support of the aid lenders. Uh, Rhodes didn't get the message in time. When he did, he frantically tried to communicate with Jameson, but Jameson had already left, um, and so the raid was underway, and this proved to be disastrous. Uh, Jameson attacked. There was no uprising uh, in, um, in the Witwatersrand region. Uh, the Reform Committee failed to generate any kind of support, um, and uh, Jameson's raid fizzled out. He um, uh, he was defeated and, and captured, surrendered, um, something like 50 miles west of uh, Johannesburg. Was not able to make it anywhere close to link up with any of the British who might have supported him. And this was an absolute disgrace. Uh, Jameson and his, and his uh, soldiers were held uh, prisoner. Um, members of the Reform Committee uh, were arrested by Kruger um, and... Uh, they, their sentence was eventually commuted, and they, you know, they were sent um, to the Cape in disgrace. Uh, Rhodes, with this as a major black mark on his career, um, decided to retire, uh, step down from his position as Cape Governor, uh, and he went off to found the Rhodes Scholarship and died a few years later, and really disappears from public life at this point. This was Paul Kruger's finest hour. Um, Kruger felt that, you know, the British Empire was like a tortoise that had stuck its head out of the shell and he had chopped it off, right? That uh, uh, this, was, this was all that the, the, you know, the British imperial pretensions amounted to, that uh, they wouldn't dare um, try anything like this again. He was mistaken, gravely mistaken in that. Because uh, Chamberlain then appointed as High Commissioner over South African Affairs um, a person who was, if anything, even more ardent in his convictions about the necessity of the British Empire, and that was Alfred Milner, pictured here at the bottom of the slide. Right? Um, Milner, immediately upon arriving in South Africa in 1897, uh, began to prepare in various ways to Send, to send Britain into war with the Afrikaners. That was really his goal, it seems, almost from the beginning, right? That, that the, you know, if they could not convince the Afrikaners to join with them voluntarily, that this would take the British military and a much larger scale operation than the Jameson Raids um, to force them to accept British rule. Um, and so immediately, immediately upon arriving in South Africa, Alfred Milner began to communicate with the eight lenders, um, began to talk about uh, his plans uh, to unite all of South Africa. Um, the eight lenders responded to this. Uh, there was a petition sent to the office of Paul Kruger that had over 20,000 signatures on it, um, demanding the right to vote for um, any eight lender who had been in the Transvaal for at least five years, uh, as well as a number of other rights that were not yet recognized. Um, these put Kruger in an impossible position. Uh, given that if he were to hand over the vote to that many British people, that uh, he would likely be overthrown or thrown out of power, um, and the British would be able to take this in a in a, a non-militaristic way, right? So Kruger refused to acknowledge any of those things. Um, there was a mitigating influence in uh, the Transvaal, and that was with the emergence of a fellow named Jan Christian Smuts. Um, another really important figure, uh, both for this period and for the next couple of decades in South African politics. So we will return to Smuts uh, several times. But um, he was a young politician at this point, a member of the Transvaal um, uh, uh, legislature. Um, he uh, had been educated at Cambridge University, so he was very familiar with the British system, uh, had many 
British friends acknowledged that uh, Britain had a lot to offer and that there maybe could be some sort of reconciliation where the British imperialists would be appeased and the Transvaal would be able to retain its independence. Um, Smuts even agreed to uh, represent the Eightlander petition uh, more forcefully with Kruger, um, but ultimately Smuts's, uh, um effort to, um, to mitigate uh, all of this and to, and to serve as a kind of arbiter failed. Um, and uh, Milner issued an ultimatum um, that Kruger recognize the demands of these petitions and grant them. Kruger responded by issuing his own ultimatum that uh, uh, the British would withdraw all of their, um, uh, it, uh, well, withdraw in a number of ways from the interests of the Transvaal. Um, and uh, this ultimately led to a declaration of war on both sides um, and thus preceded, uh, thus proceeded, I should say, the, uh, the South African War, um, which we'll talk about in the next lecture.